The idea that space would one day sit at the core of our everyday life emerged over a century ago. An idea that could only have sprung from the most imaginative minds, perhaps even the craziest ones. The countdown to the launch of the first satellites in fact began a long time ago, as early as the end of the 19th century. Since then, countless writers, illustrators and filmmakers have wandered down the paths of the future, trying to imagine what life on Earth would be like in the 21st century. Only a few of these visionaries predicted in their more or less fanciful visions that men would one day walk on the moon, and some instinctively guessed that life on Earth would become a major preoccupation for humanity. In their rather approximate guesswork, they imagined that the home of the future, like a whirling dervish, would draw its energy from cosmic forces, becoming lastingly dependent on the space surrounding us. By looking to the skies for inspiration, some of these visionaries thought maybe that the world of the third millennium would be crowded with spaceships and flying taxis. They imagined over a hundred years ago that someday space would enable us to travel and that satellites would provide information, protection, forecasts and care. They foresaw that mankind would eventually find planet Earth just too small to live on and that the time would come to spread our wings to fly further afield. Yet it took over a century for these predictions to come true. It needed all this time for man to hone his wisdom and deepen his knowledge to be ready for the conquest of space. On October the 4th, 1957, to the world's surprise, a Soviet rocket was launched carrying a companion that made this first journey famous. Mankind had finally accomplished a long-standing ambition. It was something that marked the beginning of a new era. Something that was as small as a star, and yet, at the same time, as big. By the way, did you know that Sputnik is the Russian word for companion? Despite being small and modest in weight, Sputnik 1 was the first landmark of the space era. Who knows, it would perhaps lead the way towards the conquest of the Moon, Mars, Venus, and journeys towards new worlds yet to be discovered. But far from leading the way to worlds in hyperspace, this little ball of aluminium that circled the world in 98 minutes has drawn in the sky a mirror of our daily life. And finally, like a performer making its final bow to the audience, Sputnik left the stage. It didn't come back to Earth, although it changed life on our planet for all future generations. The limited baggage it carried went up in smoke. To tell the truth, apart from a transmitter and batteries, there was not much inside the first satellite, which was only 58 centimeters wide and weighed a mere 84 kilos. To fulfill the dream of colonizing outer space, man sent a few scouts in advance. Mice, dogs, small monkeys, and all sorts of animals took off for a free ride in orbit, way before man took his chances. We didn't promise them paradise, but we certainly gave them a tough time. Still in the lead, the Russians put Sputnik 2 into orbit, carrying aboard Laika, the first living animal sent into space. Our four-legged friends took it all rather well, except perhaps for this chimpanzee sent into space for behavior observation. By pressing the red button, he would get a banana, while pressing the green button, he would get a small electric shock. The poor animal got it all right, but the wiring was accidentally reversed, and things happened the other way around. It was no surprise that after coming out of the capsule, the first reaction of this unfortunate chimp was to bite the men who'd brought him down. <laughs> it was only human. And what about the Americans? They were beginning to feel outdone in the war of nerves opposing them to the Soviets, and this put them under pressure. Until one day, they decided to strike a strong blow before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. John Kennedy promised the moon to voters, 
and the world awoke in a dream. But this was not the starting point for the unlikely colonization of space. In fact, things took a spectacular turn and focused back on Earth. The Apollo program brings us the very first images from the Earth taken from another celestial object. We see the Earth as a small blue planet and we realize it is fragile, lost in the immensity of dark space. It certainly is a striking vision. I believe that image changed our perception of the Earth. We realize how small it is and that it might be unique. Up to now, we haven't found life on any other celestial body, and as such, it must be preserved. At the beginning, the space era was triggered by prestige, rivalry, challenge, and also by security. Yet space teaches us more and more about our planet and helps us to improve how we use its resources. Space services are increasingly useful for the Earth's inhabitants and help us manage the planet. This was the time when men began to picture space as a sort of megalopolis with a few suburban satellites gravitating on the outskirts of the central planet Earth. Further away, connected to the metropolis by communication axes, some suburban districts would in time become a part of the gigantic web through which all sorts of exchanges would circulate. Based on the megalopolis model, men began to create a gigantic orbital network. Once more, man surpassed his wildest dreams, and today hundreds of silent birds hover constantly over our heads. Half angels, half machines, this new species bred by man soon adapted to their environment, the void of space surrounding the Earth. Decade after decade, they have expanded to form a protective web around our planet, forever changing our everyday life. So the way an object is put into an orbit can be explained mainly because of the Earth is round. If we throw an object, typically it will fall a few meters away from us. If we throw the object a little bit faster, it will fall a little bit farther. At a certain moment, and because the Earth is round, we see that the object will not fall into the Earth, but it will be put into an orbit. On the nearest orbits, Earth observation satellites and the International Space Station circle the planet at an altitude of a few hundred kilometers. 24,000 kilometers from the ground, there are navigation satellites such as the GPS system or in the near future, the 30 satellites of Europe's Galileo system. And then at 36,000 kilometers from Earth is the geostationary orbit which was first postulated by Kepler as early as the 16th century. More recently, Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 A Space Odyssey, described its potential with extraordinary precision long before the first satellite reached this magic circle. Arthur C. Clarke obtained his first great success as a scientist. He was only 28 years old when he wrote an article describing the use of satellites in geostationary orbit, having just completed service in the British Army during the Second World War as a radar communications engineer. This was in 1945. At that time, man was already capable of transmitting information through radio signals. In his last interview, just before he died, Clark still talked with passion about the geostationary orbit. Our planet has one natural satellite. Uh, Mars is lucky at us too, uh, but they're very small. Our satellite, in the moon, uh, takes, of course, a month to go around the Earth. And it occurred to me that it was a satellite that took just one day to go around the Earth. They would appear to be fixed in the sky. And that, of course, would be ideal location for any kind of broadcasting system. And that is what has happened. 
and I wrote this up in Wireless World in 1945 and uh, never really expected to see it happen in my lifetime. I'm pretty happy that I did. I don't know who first attached my name to the idea of it out as a satellite, but of course I'm very proud of it. It gives me a feeling of immortality. Aligned on a perfectly circular orbit in the equatorial plane, satellites are called geostationary because they appear to be fixed in the sky to an observer on the ground. This immobility is only apparent. In fact, they are moving at more than three kilometers per second. From their bird's eye view, geostationary satellites are able to connect two points thousands of kilometers apart, even in the most isolated areas. Relaying information worldwide in real time, these birds have completely transformed our environment by making the global television experience possible and accessible for every home, irrespective of location. Theoretically, three equidistant satellites would be enough to cover the planet, with the exception of polar regions. But this works only in theory. The fact is that over 350 satellites share the geostationary orbit, ensuring coverage on demand. Frequency coordination between satellite operators is managed by the International Telecommunication Union, based in Geneva. The geostationary orbit forms a 265,000 kilometer long belt, along which satellites are placed at precise positions separated by 1,500 kilometers. All communication satellites have the same way of working. They receive a signal from the Earth through their antennae, amplify the signal, and relay it back to Earth to their coverage area. Transmission equipment is fixed on a central case. Thermal protection isolates the equipment from space's hostile environment and radiative surfaces evacuate the heat produced by the case. In addition to housing control systems, the case accommodates the propulsion system and combustive tanks. The propulsion system enables trajectory correction in the event of disruption related to the attraction of the sun and moon and irregularities in the Earth's gravitational field. The two solar panels provide the electrical energy and rechargeable batteries take over when the satellite passes into the Earth's shadow at each equinox. From its altitude, a satellite can reach antennae located on the ground, on ships at sea, and on aircraft in flight. In theory, it's visible to almost half the planet, but operators like UTELSAT equip their satellites with antennae specifically designed to cover precise zones of the planet, from a country to several continents. Inside the, the coverage, you can see that we have different power levels. There's a direct link between the power level radiated by the satellite and the size of ground station antenna that you need to be able to receive the signal with good quality. For high power coverages, you can use a small 60 centimeter dish for direct broadcast TV reception. For the lower power areas, these are more ideally suited for television transmission to data heads. This is more ideally suited to power transmission to cable heads or as well data transmission services with larger antennas. Here we are in front of a one-tenth scale model of one of the satellites in the Eutelsat fleet. Before we reach the stage of putting a satellite like this up into orbit, we have to place the contract with the satellite manufacturer. And before we reach that stage, there is at least six months of work that goes on inside of Eutelsat with a team of experts to define the mission. As part of the work required to define the satellite mission, we need to define the coverages that we need. And from there, we can define the number of antennas that we need on board the satellite. A ground station antenna typically comprises of a parabolic reflector and a feed. When we use this type of antenna on a spacecraft, this would allow us just to form a small spot inside a, uh, a region on the ground. Most satellite antennas have contoured beams which allow us to cover regions that we're interested in on the ground. One way to create a contoured beam is to add extra feeds onto the antenna and this will generate extra beams on the ground and so we'll be able to generate 
a contoured beam in this way. Another way, which has a much lower mass and cost, which is always welcome in satellite communications, is to shape the reflector while still using a single feed. So in this case, we distort the reflector. And what this does is distort the spot from a circular spot onto the coverage that we require. This is the case for the African beam of the W7 satellite, where we've used sophisticated software to design the surface of the reflector to enable us to efficiently cover the region that we're interested in Africa. Despite appearances, these men are not making the biggest chocolate bar in the world. No, we're in a clean room, absolutely free of any trace of dust. It is here that over several long months, the thousands of pieces composing these meticulous technological miracle machines are assembled. In the vacuum of space and exposed to extreme thermal variation between minus 150 degrees Celsius and plus 150 degrees Celsius, our space ambassadors are designed to operate for 15 years or more in a hostile environment. Each element making up the satellite requires a long development process, often leading to technological breakthroughs. This was the case with sun-powered cells, designed first to be used in space, and now slowly spreading to rooftops around the world. Finally, the satellite gets to the final makeup and dressing stage. Once it's placed at its location in orbit, our star won't be able to come back for a fix-up. After these meticulous procedures, tough stunt training will prepare our satellite for the strenuous conditions it will face in space. Vibration tests, noise resistance in acoustic chamber, extreme cold and heat resistance tests. The satellite will be fully tested before ultimately being encased in its transport container. The satellite gets then a one-way ticket to its launch pad. No time to bask in the sun as the final preparation takes place. Most important, don't forget to fill the propellant. This is indispensable to make it into final orbit and for any movements the satellite will need to perform when it gets there. Imagine getting ready for a 15-year picnic. The satellite is then transported to the assembly tower to be installed in the upper stage of the launch vehicle. A few days before the launch, the completed rocket is transferred to the launch pad. Geostationary satellites use launchers able to inject them into space at speeds of 10 kilometers a second at the moment of separation. These heavy lift launchers are approximately 60 meters high and weigh over 700 tons at liftoff. A rocket like an Ariane 5 ECA is able to propel two geostationary satellites in one go, with a total mass of up to eight tons. Launch time has come. In the Kourou control room, everyone is building up to countdown. Orbiting a satellite represents huge economic and scientific stakes. Sometimes the result of 20 years of preparation will depend on the success of the launch. It's not the moment to lose your calm. The launch is a dramatic moment. The last one I witnessed in Kourou was the launch of Herschel and Planck, two missions of the European Space Agency. Ariane 5 launched both satellites, everything went fine, we saw the rocket light up, everybody went quiet. We heard the rocket's noise, it's not just noise, it's a vibration, it shakes, you can feel it and you get a knot in your stomach. And we saw it go, exactly as planned. And we thought, all this work for this big firework. And then we watched, we followed it with binoculars. There was smoke, was that normal? Was everything okay? And we lost sight of it in the clouds. Video transmission took over. We watched it on television, the faces of the people in the control room. They all looked happy, but tense. And it took a while before we knew the fairing had opened correctly and the satellites had separated. Wow, what a relief. We went to celebrate. Up there, there's also a sense of relief. 
the fairing is released once the satellite is in geostationary transfer orbit. The solar panels, which are folded at launch to fit into the rocket's fairing, are partially deployed. This partial deployment is sufficient to supply energy to the electrical equipment as the satellite progresses towards its orbital position. The satellite's trajectory is brought to a circular orbit through a series of firings of an onboard Apogee motor. Once in geostationary orbit, the solar panels and onboard antennae are fully deployed. The satellite's span can be approximately 40 meters, which is about the length of four buses. It begins its drift towards the place allocated to it on the geostationary ring. Its position on this ring is expressed in degrees longitude, east or west of the Greenwich meridian. After separation from the launcher, the satellite transmits telemetry data back to Earth, which enables controllers to analyze and check the performance of all onboard systems at all times. If required, a faulty system can be replaced by spare equipment on board the satellite. Control of the satellite within the orbital window it has been allocated, as well as pointing of its antennae towards the Earth, are also permanently monitored. Ground controllers carry out routine maneuvers every two weeks to correct any drifting off course by activating the satellite's propulsion system. One or more inertia wheels inside the satellite provide stabilization through a spinning effect. Managing the end of a geostationary satellite's operational life is regulated by a convention respected by operators. Satellites must have enough propellant after a 15-year lifespan to reach an end-of-life orbit located 230 kilometers above geostationary orbit. From then on, they enjoy a hard-earned leave under close surveillance. Satellites have changed forever our perception of the Earth. Since the launch of Sputnik in 1957, major progress has been made and a multitude of applications have been created thanks to satellites. All over the surface of our planet, vast fields of strange sunflowers have sprung up that point to the sky and day after day push back the boundaries that man and nature once imposed upon us. Welcome to Internet Solutions. We're here today in one of our major switching centers in uh, Bryanston in Johannesburg in South Africa. And right now on this infrastructure, there's about 3 million megabits per second of data traversing this infrastructure. All this data has been brought in from our customers from all over Africa in the financial services sector. You may be drawing money from an ATM in a remote country. That traffic's all brought into this country for approvals via our VSAT network. Or you are doing your shopping at a, at a local retail store um, where they're using satellite technology to move stock around. Um, as well as you could be sitting at home using the internet. All of that technology, all of those satellite services around the continent all come into our teleports in South Africa and distribute th through this infrastructure to our various customers. Earth is becoming a vast global village. It's no longer a surprise for us to watch pictures on television from the other side of the world as if they were from the next street. It's also a global village enabling all its citizens to stay connected to the rest of the world and to be informed in real time. A universal village where we can learn from afar. A world roadmap that helps us find our way. A world which is a safer place, where it's possible to forecast natural disasters and where satellites can help save lives. And protect endangered species. The galaxy of satellites is only just beginning to transform our lives.